Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. It is truly living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and we're thankful for that. You designed it that way because you love us, and you love us enough to go to the very root and, and uh, core of our lives and our souls to show us what it is that we need to surrender to you. Thank you so much for that living word. Now, Lord, as we examine your word today, as we talk about uh, the subject and, and what we will discuss, we pray your Holy Spirit would again be our guide and that everything that is said will be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The title of the message today is Love But Lead, A Crisis of Lost Identity. And in a sense, what we are talking about, uh, beloved, this morning is really inheritance. It's the inheritance that God has intended for us as reflected in the identity He gave us. Our inheritance and our identity are joined together. And so, while I want to look at uh, a couple of stories to set the context for where we are headed. So, if you have your Bibles, um, whether uh, electronic or physical Bible, I'd like you to turn to Genesis 25 and verses 29 through 34. And like I said yesterday, with an apology accompanying, I'm going to be moving very fast because I have a lot of material. As I have continued to work on these presentations, even up to the present time, there have been things in the news that have been coming out that have been put into this presentation because of their relevancy. So this is a fluid topic, and so we have a lot of information to cover. Genesis 25, and starting in verse 29. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was what? Talk to me, church. He was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. You see, Jacob was the second born son, albeit a few minutes later, he was the second born son. And the first born son, obviously, if you understand Old Testament days and times and culture, they had a lot of privileges. They had two thirds of the father's wealth coming to them. They had a lot of privileges and a lot of status, but with that birthright blessing came the responsibility of spiritual priesthood. And as we will see here, Esau didn't want anything to do with it. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. A little dramatic there, I would say. So what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and did what? sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank and arose and went his way. Thus, Esau did what to his birthright? He despised his birthright. I don't think he despised it because of the wealth. I think he despised it because of the spiritual responsibility that accompanied that birthright. You see, Esau thought that the birthright was worth selling. He viewed the birthright as a curse instead of a blessing because of the spiritual responsibility that it carried. He wanted to cast it off because he felt it limited his choices to do what he wanted. Are you picking up the theme already? He was impulsive in his actions and viewed immediacy as more important than eternity. What is going to happen for me today? I just want to focus on that. I'm not thinking long term. And friends, I think we could agree that our society has become very impulsive and very now oriented. I want what I want now, and I don't want to wait. And if if I have to wait and I have to look down the road in the future and, and delay gratification, then that's a problem for me. And this was Esau's issue. Esau justified his impulsive action because he thought he would die if he didn't have physical nourishment. But get this, in feeding his body, he starved his soul. In feeding his body, he starved his soul. The pottage, friends, the pottage became Esau's birthright blessing. The pottage was his identity. 
the common over the extraordinary. What a sad tale. Now I want to turn to a contrast story in 1 Kings. Turn with me there. 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings 21. One of the unsung heroes of the Bible that I don't think receives enough attention. 1 Kings 21 and starting in verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near, next to my house. And for it I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or, if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. I guess the vineyard wasn't that good of a vineyard. <laughs> Ahab wanted to take it and make it a vegetable garden. He's like, listen, I'll give you money for it. I'll, I'll make it a better vineyard or I'm going to make it a vegetable garden. Either way, let me have this piece of property. It's next to my house. Verse 3, but Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers to you. Friends, did you see that? The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers to you. Friends, the Lord forbid that we should give our inheritance to the devil. The Lord forbid. And I'm telling you what, I cannot imagine how difficult it must have been for Naboth to have the king of Samaria come by his house and say, listen, let me have that vineyard. He didn't even say, I'm king, give it to me. He said, listen, I'll give you a great price for that vineyard, but I need it. But Nahab, Naboth valued his God-given inheritance more than he valued the esteem and the status that the king was willing to provide for him. So Ahab went to his house, sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had given to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. He was having what I would term an adult temper tantrum. But Jezebel, Jezebel his wife came to him and said, why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? He said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And so Jezebel in this story writes letters getting the, the colleagues of Naboth, his townsmen, to say lies against him. And in the end, what happens to Naboth? He and his family die. Because he wouldn't give the king what he wanted. You see, Naboth viewed his inheritance as something worth what? Saving. Naboth valued his inheritance more than earthly wealth, political opportunity, or real estate improvements. Naboth understood the true value of what he had as an inheritance. You see, the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, each tribe was given an allotment in Israel, and that was a God-ordained allotment, and they were never supposed to sell it for any reason. They were supposed to pass it down. That was a representation of God's liberating them from Egyptian slavery. And friends, just like Naboth, we cannot forget that we have been liberated from the slavery of sin. And we can never release or relinquish that inheritance for a bowl of soup or a bag of money or prestige or status or frankly, more personally, our own pride and preference. Because God knows what is best for us, and the Scripture is replete with the promises of God that says, I know the thoughts that I have for you. They're thoughts to give you a blessing and a future and a hope. We can never relinquish that, and Naboth didn't. He knew. He knew that his vineyard represented more than grapes and juice. It represented the lineage of deliverance that God had wrought. It didn't need to make rational sense to him because God had said it. 
And isn't that one of the challenges that we all have as human beings in our frail condition? We have a problem sometimes with God said it, thus saith the Lord, and that's good enough. It's got to make sense first, then I'll do it. But for Naboth, as he was being drug out, I can imagine he may have been questioning and saying, why? I'm being faithful to God, and I'm losing my life for God. But in the end, he never faltered, just like Stephen. And I wonder too, someday in heaven, maybe I'll ask, I wonder if God opened the windows of heaven for Naboth as he was dying too, and showed him the reward that was waiting, awaiting him for his faithfulness. Because doesn't the book of Revelation say, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Naboth lost his vineyard and his life, but saved his eternal, er, eternal inheritance and his identity. Can you say amen out there? We're setting the context, ladies and gentlemen, because we are struggling with an inheritance that God has given us slipping through our fingers into the hand of the devil who is trying to redefine our identity and specifically the identities of our youth and our young people. And there is a subtle shift in the value that people are placing on inheritance and identity that we have been given in the, in the Word of God in our young people and I would say even in some of us who are older. The mindset of the world is truly creeping in and causing young people and old to trade their inheritance for a bowl of soup. But guess what? It's causing us to be in the soup now. Perspectives on truth that we would have never thought to move or find justification are in fact taking root, are coming up for discussion and debate even though the Word of God speaks so clearly on these issues. When have we ever thought it appropriate for us to start having discussions about whether God meant what He said? Dangerous. It's creeping into our faith communities, our churches, and our institutions. And I know this for a fact because I'm superintendent of education for the Michigan Conference. And the reason why I put this, this presentation together was because of the fact that I'm in education working with young people. This is a real issue that we are dealing with, and I also know that it's a real issue that is coming into our churches. Desire of Ages, page 308, says, God has given us His holy precepts because He loves mankind. He what? He loves mankind to shield us from the results of transgression, he reveals the principles of righteousness. God sets about for us his law so, so that we can be safe. Just like a parent puts up a fence around the yard, making sure that the child doesn't fall off the edge of the cliff and die. It's because of love. The law is an expression of the thought of God. When received in Christ, it becomes our thought. It lifts us above the power of natural desires and tendencies, above temptations that lead to sin. God desires us to be happy, and He gave us the precepts of the law that in obeying them, we might have what? Joy. Joy is a condition and a choice, not a feeling. Joy can push you through adversity but happiness is different. Happiness is a feeling and emotion. It's fine and it's okay. But if we are relating whether or not we're having a good day based upon whether we're happy or not, that can set us up for a challenge. The softening of perspectives on truth has created a dangerous openness and flexibility when it comes to things that are contrary to God's plan or law, and people that believe and adhere to the Bible are considered now in our present day rigid, close-minded, or friends, even bigoted. This is what's happening now. Remember this text? Isaiah 5.20, "'Woe to those who call evil good and good evil.'" who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
You know, I have heard people say that beer, when you first start drinking it, tastes horrible. And they say that it's an acquired taste, meaning if you drink it long enough, after a while, you'll love the taste and you'll crave the taste. Friends, that's what's happening and is being brought out in this passage. What was once bitter to the taste has now become sweet to the taste because of conditioning. One of the most significant of these shifts when it relates to identity is the context of the LGBTQ plus transgenderism, gender fluidity movement. And there are a lot more letters that go along with this. There are so many uh, genders being defined now um, that, that those letters do not even include all of the ones that exist. I shared this on Tuesday, and I took the slide and copied it and made it for today because I think it's so critically important, and it is my heart. I was ta telling my wife this this morning. I want this presentation to come across in love, friends. God loves every single one of His children equally. He died to save every single one of us because every single one of us stand in the need of His grace. I am no different. I am a frail human being who makes mistakes, who has made mistakes, and only stands here before you by the grace and righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, the information that I'm sharing today is not meant to be hurtful, it's not meant to be harmful, it's not meant to be disrespectful to any person or situation or a situation that a family might find themselves in. We are looking at some of the devastating things that Satan is using to destroy our kids. In order to do that, we have to look squarely in the face of his devices, what it is that he is doing. And frankly, friends, I think Christianity is starting to shrink back from this topic. And they're starting to feel inhibited. But we have a thus saith the Lord. And in humility and kindness, we need to step forward for the sake of our kids. We must not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if we really believe in the gospel of Christ, we believe that it liberated and freed us from sin. So why would we withhold that liberating feeling from those that are struggling in the LGBTQ community? Why would we affirm that direction, knowing that that in and of itself is going to serve to hurt them and continue to perpetuate their pain? Because guess what? As long as we walk outside of the God-ordained path that God has given us to walk, we will always find ourselves in a miserable position. We will never find happiness, so why would we affirm that? It doesn't mean we need to take out a whip or a club or be mean or be condescending or, or be judgmental or look down our nose at people. No, I said at the beginning, we're all standing in the need of grace. So we're not judging anyone's heart, but we are able, by God's grace, to judge behavior as being right or wrong, aren't we? So that's what we're looking at, friends. There is hope. There is a pathway forward. And with every temptation, God's, God makes a way of escape. So I'm hastening on, but I'm pausing again because this is so important to me that you understand where my heart is on this issue. Here's the reality. We're going to move fast. It's no secret. The LGBTQ agenda has succeeded in taking center stage in our society. June, the month we're in right now, is considered Pride Month to celebrate the LGBTQ community. Now, let me tell you something. There have been some months that are dedicated to celebrate cultures. Okay, February is Black History Month. There are other um, things that are used to celebrate. But I'm telling you, it is only in recent time that an entire month has been set aside and dedicated to what really is a more recent phenomenon. And that's significant in and of itself. Even in Michigan, our Michigan governor, you can't see the, the wording there because it's so small, but here's a picture of the announcement that was sent out just a little bit ago. Happy Pride Month. This June, we celebrate the rich history, culture, and courage of the LGBT community. Every person, no matter who they love or how they identify, deserves to feel safe, valued, and supported. I want you to know that I see you. I've got your back. 
and I'll never stop fighting for your right to live as your full, authentic self right here in Michigan. And then she goes on to say the issue is personal for her. This is not just something that is individualized and personalized as a choice. This is something that now has governmental protections that is being propagated and set up and encouraged by state and federal legislation. Gay marriage has now been legalized. The definition of marriage between a man and a woman at the federal level has been changed. And now you know what that's opened up. It's opened up everything. And now we're having a difficult time defining. And I'm telling you what, it's opening up the doors for some things that we would have never imagined possible. It's making it much more difficult for people to not consider the potential for pedophilia and why that would not be considered appropriate. I'm telling you, I heard on the radio a professor at a university say that they want to change the definition of pedophilia to something less harsh. Folks, when you take away what God has ordained as truth, you, you, you aren't able to define what right and wrong is anymore. And then that becomes the gateway open to some horrific, unimaginable things. Psychology's role. Here I am, a therapist, a psychologist. And I have to tell you, psychology is one of the most atheist fields in society because it attempts to answer the God whole question. All these theorists, all these techniques. Now, I'm not saying counseling is wrong. I told you sometimes we need counselors, but make sure you pick them well. Make sure you pick a Christian counselor. A counselor should work within your particular worldview and meet you there and then help you work through the challenges that you have. But it is important for you to have a counselor that, that shares, uh, relatively speaking, your worldview. And in this case, Christianity. In 1952, the DSM-1, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, it is our diagnostic manual that provides the criteria for if someone has a disorder, um, they would need to meet like four out of six of these and so forth. In 1952, this manual classified homosexuality as a sociopathic personality disturbance. Okay, that's a very heavy diagnosis. In 1968, just a few years later, it reclassified it as a sexual deviation. A few years later, in 1973, it removed homosexuality as a psychological disorder altogether. It took it completely away. In 1970 and 71, at the American Psychiatric Association convention, gay activists disrupted the meetings as protest against the pathological model of homosexuality. Even the World Health Organization, up until 1990, had homosexuality on their list of diseases. So psychology took a more, I would say, not that they intended to, more of a biblically consistent perspective on homosexuality in society, and yet, as you can see, slowly eroded that to softer and softer definitions until finally they've removed it, and now they're encouraging it. They are taking a prominent role in actually supporting and encouraging this lifestyle, including transgenderism. Some states have even outlawed conversion therapy. If you have a young person or an adult that comes to you and says, I am struggling with homosexual ideation, I don't believe that it's right, and I want to move in a different direction, a therapist in certain states is not allowed to counsel them in a way that would convert them from homosexuality to heterosexuality. Conversion therapy laws prohibit licensed mental health practitioners from subjecting, this is a quote, LGBTQ minors to harmful conversion therapy practices that attempt to change their sexual orientation or gender identity. These laws do not restrict the practice among religious providers. So if you are a religious counselor, then you could have someone come to you and work under that context. But as far as secular counseling is concerned, if you are in these specific states, you are not allowed to provide conversion therapy for your client. The green states up on the screen are the states that have already banned conversion therapy. And you see it's mostly on the western uh, seaboard and the eastern seaboard of the United States. The other colors represent those that have uh, current uh, legislation to be voted on. So psychology is taking a role that definitely is 
promoting, affirming, and encouraging this movement that is completely antithetical to the Word of God, friends. I have been very curious for many years why the LGBT community utilizes the rainbow theme, and now there's additional things that they've added to it to represent more of the, um, you know, gender choices and some of that. I've always been curious why they chose the rainbow theme, and I believe God pointed me in this direction. A little history. In 1978, drag performer Gilbert Baker created the rainbow flag, and it has since been adopted as the LGBTQ symbol. Why would this symbol, this color scheme, be chosen by the community as the foundational symbol for their beliefs and movement? It's the same reason that Satan has attempted to blaspheme God's identity with false narratives on every beautiful and love-based truth that represents his character. The reason is because And I'm not saying these individuals thought this when they were doing it, but who is the author of every lie? Who is the author of every falsehood? Satan. This symbol blasphemes the plan of salvation. Look at this. This is a quote from Ellen White in the Review and Herald. It's long, but I'm going to read it because it's so powerful. Can you see it okay? Behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a what? A rainbow around the throne. In sight like unto an emerald, Revelation 4, 2, and 3. In the rainbow above the throne, Ellen White says, is an everlasting testimony that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. As the bow in the cloud is formed by the union of the sunlight and the shower. Listen carefully, folks. So the rainbow encircling the throne represents the combined power of mercy and justice. I was blown. Are you blown away? I was blown away when I read that. Encircling the throne of God, this rainbow represents the power of mercy and justice. It is not justice alone that is to be maintained. For this would eclipse the glory of the rainbow of promise above the throne. Men could see only the penalty of the law. Were there no justice, no penalty, there would be no stability to the government of God. Balance. It is the mingling of judgment and mercy that makes salvation complete. Somebody ought to say amen. Mercy invites us to enter through the gates into the city of God. Friends, do you realize that God saving us does not in any way marginalize or degrade the justice of His law? Do you know that? Do you know how important that is? If it would have, then Satan's argument would have been correct. But no, salvation is an absolutely perfect balance between God's justice and His law kept perfectly through the life of Jesus Christ combined with His endless and bottomless grace that He's willing to give us when He looks at our life of sin. If we're in Jesus Christ, He sees Jesus' perfect life and we are saved and justified through the blood of Jesus Christ standing legitimately in heaven, justified for eternity. It's the perfect balance. Mercy invites us to enter through the gates into the holy city of God, and justice is satisfied to accord to every obedient soul full of privileges as a member of the royal family, a child of the heavenly king. If we were defective in character, we could not pass the gates that mercy has opened to the obedient. For justice stands at the entrance and demands holiness in all who would see God. And then it says, too, that if justice was extinct and were it possible for divine mercy to open the gates to the whole race, irrespective of character, there would be a worse condition of disaffection and rebellion in heaven than before Satan was expelled. So, friends, the reason why... Satan wanted this rainbow theme to be used as the LGBTQ symbol is because it is a direct assault on the salvation picture that is seen at the throne of God. For every truth that God has, Satan attempts a counterfeit. 
It is the mingling of judgment and mercy that makes salvation full and complete. It is the blending of the two that leads us as we view the world's Redeemer and the law of Jehovah to exclaim, Thy gentleness hath made me great. We know that the gospel is a perfect and complete system, revealing the immutability of the immutability of the law of God. Mercy invites us to enter through the gates into the city of God, and justice is sacrificed to accord every obedient soul full privileges as a member of the royal family, a child of the heavenly king. By faith, let us look upon the rainbow round the throne, the cloud of sins confessed behind it, the soul that his life is one with Christ and that Christ is one with God. The wrath of God will not fall upon one soul that seeks refuge in him. God himself has declared, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. The bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant. Powerful. God's amazing grace, page 70. Oh, friends, I want to talk about transgenderism. Children and adolescents are identifying as transgender and claiming ownership to gender identity that is outside of their unalterable biological genetic code, and science and psychology are supporting it. Some states are protecting the ability of children to identify as the opposite sex without parental consent or even awareness. Notice these quotes. A federal appeals court on Monday ruled that a group of parents could not challenge a Maryland school district's policy against telling parents if their children's identity as transgender or gender nonconforming. Reuters, August 14, 2023. The New York Post, Post on March 8 of last year said more than 3.2 million U.S. public school students are covered by guidance that blocks parents from knowing whether their child identifies as a different gender in the classroom. And some parents are coming unglued, and rightfully so. I'm so thankful that's not the way it is in Adventist education, ladies and gentlemen. That is not the way it is in our schools. So you have children who are 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, who within themselves are making decisions that say, I don't want to be a boy anymore, I don't want to be a girl anymore, I want to identify with this uh, gender or, or maybe an animal. And the school is in a position to sit them down and say, oh, you do? Okay. Here's what we can do to help you, and you don't have to tell mommy and daddy. Friends, that is warped. Here's why. Again, the fatal flaw. In the United States, you've got to be 18 to fight in a war or get drafted. You've got to be 18 to vote. You've got to be 18 to serve on a jury, change your name, run for office, get married without parental consent, move out, of your own, move, move out on your own, sign a legally binding contract, buy a lottery ticket, and as my dad who works in trust services said, inherit money. You've got to be 18 to do that. Guess what? In the United States, you've got to be 21 years of age to drink alcohol, go to a casino and gamble, legally rent a car, earn a pilot's license, obtain a concealed pistol license, adopt a child, or go to a nightclub. You've got to be 21 years old to do that. Why? Because each of the choices are considered to have significant consequences attached to them if a wrong decision is made. Hmm. Wasn't well, that interesting? It is therefore assumed that the individual making these choices has the emotional and psychological maturity and experience to more than likely make the right choice. So the government has set a standard of age limitation for certain kinds of activity, but are saying that if a nine-year-old child wants to change their gender identity, that they have the right to do so and they have the maturation to do so and parents don't need to be made aware the kinds of choices that require a certain level of maturity are reflected in the same way in this particular context also, if not more so. The psychological, emotional, ethical, moral capacity to determine their desire to identify as an opposite sex person and go through the drugs and surgeries to make it happen? You think a 9 or 10 year old child can have the maturity to do that? Friends. That doesn't make sense. Just last week, or maybe the week before, the American College of Pediatrics has made a statement, and I'm not going to read through all of it, but essentially 
the American College of Pediatrics has signed a document, and there are other entities that have signed it as well. They are calling, I'll just read the first part, therefore, given the recent research and the revelations of the harmful approach advocated by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health and its followers in the United States, we, the undersigned, call upon the medical professional organizations of the United States, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, the Pediatric Endocrine Society, American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry to follow the science and their European professional colleagues and immediately stop the promotion of social affirmation, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and surgeries for children and adolescents who experience distress over their biological sex. Instead, these organizations should recommend comprehensive evaluations and therapies aimed at identifying and addressing underlying psychological comorbidities and neurodiversity that often predispose to and accompany gender dysphoria. We also encourage the physicians who are members of these professional organizations to contact their leadership and urge them to adhere to the evidence-based research now available. Somebody ought to say amen. This is June 6, 2024, friends. The American College of Pediatrics has had enough, and they are calling on their professional colleagues to follow the actual science. There's some other things that they uh, put here on their website. We affirm, they, they state that sex is dimorphic, meaning you're a man or a woman, and it's based on your chromosomes. All of these things, it is so powerful, I would encourage you to look at it. They also share some alarming st statistics from some studies that have been done that have been showing the adverse effects of transgender therapies and the affirming socially of transgenderism and the harm that it is causing to young people. And I praise God for this because it takes guts. And they stood up in a news conference recently, I don't know if anyone saw it, and they actually read that statement um, to the public. This is a resource that I would also recommend. I have not had a chance to look at it in great depth. Obviously, this was just June 6th that it came out, but this is also a resource that they have put out. Um, it's called biologicalintegrity.org, and they have resources for schools, they have resources for parents, and they have resources for young people who are struggling. Now, it is not a Christian-oriented perspective that they are proposing as far as I can see, but it is very much in line with um, you are born a boy, and therefore you are, or you are born a girl, and therefore you are, and they want to work through providing a, a firm affirmation for that instead of affirming the other. It's biologicalintegrity.org. How about transgenderism and women's rights? I just wanted to throw this slide in here real quickly, because this is a really important issue. This is an assault on women's rights. Women in this country have gone through a challenging history. You've heard of women's suffrage. Women were not allowed to vote. Women were in a subservient role in society. And what transgenderism is doing, it is actually reversing and eroding the progress that has been made in women's rights. Specifically, if a man can identify as a woman, then we have completely done a disservice to what it means to bring a child into the world. How can a man identify as a woman when they, are, or they don't have the capacity to have a child and they've never been through childbirth? I was at the birth of my four children, and my admiration for my wife is pretty deep, let me tell you. Okay, so for a man to, to assume that all of a sudden they can wake up one day and say, I'm a woman now, is to really, in my opinion, insult what it is to be a woman and to go through the things that a woman does on behalf of her family. We've done a disservice to all the countless women who've experienced bias and prejudice at the voting booth and fought for women's rights. What about women's athletics? It is completely turning women's athletics upside down and causing so much consternation when you have a biological man and, and when men have 40% on average more muscle mass than women because of the way that God created us for our specific roles, then how in the world is, is a woman supposed to be encouraged to compete against that? 
And frankly, if you are a biological man and you go into a situation where you win a race or you win something like that, how can you feel uh, joy with that when you know that your anatomy and your physiology and, and your cells and your muscle mass are automatically going to give you an advantage? It's just really creating a lot of questions all across the board, and it's challenging. Friends, even Christian faiths have now adopted and support LGBTQ and transgender lifestyles within the confines of acceptability, something that God's Word does not. More and more religions are uh, putting gay clergy even into the roles of spiritual guides and interpreters of the Scriptures, friends. More and more of these individuals are gaining more and more prominent places in our society, in our legislation, and uh, professorships, and um, all kinds of places where they're propagating these agendas, and it's making it more and more difficult. There are even alternate interpretations of Scripture that have been attempted to show and dis to skew and distort homosexual behaviors, uh, like Romans chapter 1 talks about. And, and trying to misinterpret and misappropriate what clearly the Word of God says. And so, I would like to also share with you, before we move to the next slide, uh, the seminary at Andrews University put out a very good paper on the biblical view of homosexual, homosexual practice and pastoral care. And if you go online and you type in um, something along those lines, you will, you will see uh, this statement. It is a really good statement. Uh, related to the topic that we're talking about today. In significant amounts of, of oh, oh here, here's, here's how I want to uh, contextualize this statement. If significant amounts of my time, not my time, but collectively, if, if an individual's, if a significant amount of an individual's time revolves around projecting a specific agenda related to their identity, it can mean that they're insecure in their position and overcompensating for it. The LGBTQ community, for many of them, their whole life revolves around the fact that they're LGBTQ. My whole life does not revolve around the fact that I'm heterosexual, meaning I don't have to go out and push that agenda everywhere I go. And when you have a culture or a context that is doing that, to me as a therapist, it demonstrates insecurity in that position. Because you have to over-justify it and you have to make a statement to everybody that you're around because you're insecure about it or maybe deep, deep down you think it might not be right. There's even an entity that calls themselves the SDA Kinship and it is a group of uh, professed Adventists who reach out to LGBTQ folk with, within the context of what they would term uh, Seventh-day Adventism. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church obviously does not have any affiliation with this, um, but here are some things that they put on their website in their what we believe statement. We believe God loves all His children equally and unconditionally. I agree with that. No matter our gender, identity, or sexual orientation, I agree with that. We believe non-heterosexual orientations are not in and of themselves pro problematic and so do not merit therapy, suppression, or change. We honor our members' consciences about faith and what they believe God requires of them, self-determinism. Some have chosen committed relationships, some have built families with children, and others are celibate. All must be convinced in their own mind as the Lord leads them. What does the Bible say? What did Jesus say? In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of what? Men. Friends, these last two bullets are the commandments of men. You work it out in your own consciousness, we'll support you, and God won't mind. The last bullet. Whatever their journey, we support all of them as they grow in grace. Here's something fascinating. As the United States has continued to move off of its Judeo-Christian heritage and open up legality for gay marriage in 2015, we have seen an explosion in the LGBTQ agenda and demands, but also the divergence of sexual identity, transgenderism, and non-binary uh, terminology, etc. In Mark Finley's book, The Next Superpower, it notes that in the United States, 87% of people believe in the immortality of the soul. I would propose 
that this generally held belief of the immortality of the soul has opened the door for homosexuality, but specifically transgenderism, and here's why. If the soul is somehow separate from the body or independent from it, I am now enabled to disassociate myself from myself and therefore identify as whatever I want. If my body is just the vehicle that carries my soul that's eternal, then it doesn't really matter what I think about the connection between my body and my soul. And if my soul feels like it's incongruent with what my body represents, because we've got this dichotomy between the soul and the body, I can now author myself to be whatever I want to be. And that's how doctrinal slippage and the misinterpretation of the Word of God can set us up to be in a position where we become susceptible or more susceptible to these kinds of deceptions with transgenderism and gender identity. Why is it so important for us to understand societal evolution and the evolution that can come into the church when it comes to these things? Meaning, the individual becoming less and less aware of the differentiation between right and wrong and the lines becoming blurred. Why is that so important to understand? It's, it all goes back to the frog in the boiling water. If you take a frog and you put him in a boiling pot of water, if it's able to, it's going to jump right out because its senses are telling them something's wrong. But if you put a frog in a pot of lukewarm water and you turn the heat up slowly, the frog will sit there as content as this frog is portraying, not realizing that in the process of staying in the water, it is actually cooking itself. Friends, Satan is doing everything he can to erode our consciousness and our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit because he wants to slowly cook us to the point where it is irrecoverable. And in our schools and our churches, we're seeing this leak in. And I, I want to just take a little sidebar, and I'm, I'm getting short on time here. Unfortunately, on many issues within the church, we see the same polarization on issues that we see reflected in society. And I don't think that it should be that way. And I think when we talk about things like women's ordination and, and the consternation that that caused the church and the amount of money, time, and effort that was put into that and the polarization and the, the vitriol that was going back and forth on that, and you know what I think that does? I think that sets up our church, us as the church, for some of these other things to come in a lot easier. We must be united, friends. It doesn't mean that we are conforming our thought and we don't have the ability to be independent thinkers. No, that's not how God made us. But collectively, when we make a decision, we must walk together hand in hand. And we must accept and submit ourselves to the collective decisions of the church. Because when we don't and we allow there to be fissures created within the church, Satan is able to come in and sow his weeds in the wheat field. And then we become more vulnerable to differentiations of thought on these kinds of issues. Because Satan isn't boiling the water up and then trying to push us in. He's trying to put us in a lukewarm pot that he wants to turn up the heat slowly until it's too late for us to recover. So in our schools and churches, we see these same things. Within our student populations, especially in the high school age, there is a growing sympathy towards the LGBTQ behavior. Most do not desire it in their own lifestyle, but they're saying, who am I to judge? Who, who, who am I to say that I'm better than, than this person? If that's what they want to do, then that's fine. They're my friends. And we've become more accepting of it in our school context. There's been an inundation in social media, movies, TV, uh, government, religious denominations, that the LGBTQ culture and that young people are getting used to it, and adults are too. There's an individualism that has taken over our culture that has become a prohibitor to corporate accountability 
don't tell me what to do. That's your truth. This is my truth. Young people somehow feel it disloyal to a friend to help steer them in the right direction because they have begun to wonder if LGBTQ is really wrong after all. But sadly, you have to think something is wrong to even be in a position to care. And if our young people are losing their moral compass, they're not going to be in a position to be able to tell someone something different. The other thing that's happening within our uh, belief system, I've heard in some circles, is, is calling uh, homosexual sin the same as heterosexual sin. And I want to talk about this briefly and share with you what the Scripture says. All sin has the same wage, yes? The wages of sin is death. It doesn't matter what the sin is. Okay? But we have to remember that certain sins are more heinous in the eyes of God than others. Heterosexual sin is wrong. However, there's, there's becoming this equalization happening between homosexual sin and heterosexual sin. Both are within the same context of sexual sin. Don't get me wrong. Homosexual behavior is biologically, anatomically, and physiologically incompatible as compared with heterosexual behavior. Both are sexual sin, but they are still different. The Bible relates to them differently, friends. This isn't me saying this. Okay? The Bible says that homosexual behavior is an abomination. It was one of the main reasons why Sodom was destroyed and where we get the term sodomy. Steps to Christ, page 30, says God does not view all sins of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in His estimation as well as that of man. So it's, it's, it's not to say that we should therefore empower people in heterosexual sin, by no means. But we are starting to get into a situation where we're equalizing. And we have to be careful because it will affect how much we are prompted to help and how much we are prompted to guide. How do we lead in our schools and our churches? Building strong, appropriate relationships is key. What is the spiritual orientation of the person? That is so incredibly huge. Are they desiring to do what is right? Are they struggling against what is wrong? Or are they embracing what is wrong? Struggling people that recognize that this is wrong and want to follow Christ can be helped and supported in their journey. How can they be helped? Make sure they understand the mechanics of how to have a personal devotional life with Jesus and spend time in His Word and then Spirit of Prophecy. Make sure they understand the dangers of mobile devices, entertainment, movies, and music, and how this preys on their sensibilities and beliefs. You can't even watch a commercial now without the LGBTQ uh, agenda being promoted. You can't even watch a program. You can't even go to the airport and stand in line to get on a plane without seeing posters. It's everywhere, folks. We've got to guard our children and guard their minds. They're being bombarded. They're even having friends at school who are suggesting to them that they need to go down this path. Do you know that I heard from someone who works with uh, non-public school students? Um, I mean, excuse me, uh, they work in public school university settings. They said that it's the coolest thing now to be gay in high school. It's okay to be heterosexual, but the really cool thing is to be gay. And if you dress really, really well and really, really smartly, you'll have students that'll come up to you and say, hey, are you gay? No, I'm not gay. Well, are you sure? And they're pressuring these kids. Our young people are being victimized by society and by the media, and we've got to protect them. Make sure there's a trusted person that they are talking with that can help them process forward through the challenges that they are facing. Loving and leading. People that are settled in their decision and refuse to see the wrong in it. And maybe sharing this with others, they pose a serious threat to other people and to our overall institutions and churches. We must protect our kids from these influences. Our love extends to all people. However, and I say this in love, there are times when we need to take a strong stand on these issues, and this may mean that individuals cannot remain in our schools and our churches if they're propagating, advertising, and justifying these behaviors as appropriate and expecting accommodation for this behavior. Do not fall into the trap of having so much sympathy for someone that you are unable to hold them accountable and you actually become an enabler to that which is hurting them. Sometimes the only way for someone to recognize the gravity of their choices is through consequences. However, 
We never stop loving them, and we never stop seeking to win them back to Jesus. Those who had remained loyal to God must be encouraged to persevere in right doing, and sinners must, if possible, be induced to turn from iniquity, patriarchs and prophets. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Mr. Rogers and Mom, thank you so much for having us watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I, my sister got me some Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood socks, and I've got them on today, folks. I love Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. My mom wouldn't let me watch Sesame Street, and I think she was wise. She saw something in that program that maybe, eh, but Mr. Rogers, he was on all the time. In 1967, Mr. Rogers composed a song that he sang on his program. The song talked about the unique differences found in boys and girls and how each was special and unique. His song spoke to the origination of gender as having started right at the beginning. And he wrote this in 1967. He was ordained by, I believe, the Presbyterian Church for children's ministry. And it it may just be possible that the Holy Spirit impressed upon him what young people would be facing. And the video that I'm hoping I'll be able to show you, and if not, I'll just share with you the lyrics of the song. It's fine. Shows a compilation of Mr. Rogers singing this song in 1967, 1973, all the way through to the very end of his ministry on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And it is so incredibly powerful. Let me just see if it'll play here. Everybody's fancy, everybody's fine. Your body's fancy, and so is mine. Boys are boys from the beginning. If you were born a boy, you stay a boy. Girls are girls right from the start. When you're born a girl, baby, you grow up to be a bigger girl and then a woman. Everybody's fancy. Everybody's fine, your body's fancy, and so is mine. Only girls can grow up to be the mummies. Only boys can grow up to be the daddies. Everybody's fancy, everybody's fine. Your body's fancy, and so is mine. I think you're a special person. And I like your ins and outsides. Everybody's fancy, everybody's fine. Your body's fancy, and so is mine. True. Amen. Isn't that special? Some are fancy on the outside, some are fancy on the inside. Everybody's fancy. Everybody's fine. Your body's fancy, and so is mine. Boys are boys from the beginning. Girls are girls right from the start. Everybody's fancy. Everybody's fine. Your body's fancy, and so is mine. Girls grow up to be the mommies. Boys grow up to be the daddies. Everybody's fancy. Everybody's fine. Your body's fancy, and so is mine. Say the last verse with me. I think you're a special person, and I like your ins and outsides. Everybody's fancy, everybody's fine, your body's fancy, and so is mine. Friends, Mr. Rogers had it right, didn't he? He had it right. And by God's grace, God can take any challenge, any difficulty, any struggle, And any mistake that we have ever made, and He can redeem us and restore His image in us. So I don't know if there might be somebody online, I don't know if there might be someone in here who is struggling with this issue, or has a loved one that is struggling with this issue. Let me tell you something. Sometimes... We forget how big God is and we make Satan loom much larger than he is. 
if we believe that we serve a big God that is capable of restoring His image in us, then that understanding by faith alone can give us the power by the Holy Spirit to move forward and recenter our lives into what God has called us to be. How many of us want that for our own lives right now, from this day and forevermore? Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we are living at the end of time. Even as it was in the days of Noah, your word says, so would it be at the end of time. Father in heaven, it is easy to look around us and to keep our eyes horizontally focused instead of vertically focused. Lord, forgive us when we become despondent with the challenges that we face, forgetting that we serve a God of grace. Help us to realize Your love for us every morning when we wake up. Help us to realize that You have created us. You have knit us together in our mother's womb. You have imbued us with gifts to be used to benefit other people and in the process to benefit our own lives. Lord, let us not fall short of the plan that You have laid out for us but let us not be reliant upon our own will, our own strength. Help us to rely upon Your strength. We love You. We thank You. And Lord, I say a special portion of this prayer for any of our dear friends who might be struggling with some of the issues we've spoken about this week. Lord, I plead that in this moment, through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus, you would reach into their hearts and show them your love in a way they've never seen before so that they can know how much you love them and that you died to save them. In Jesus' name, amen.